Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about three-dimensional space generally, but then specifically get into some details about vectors in three dimensions. As we continue this topic, you'll see why the emphasis early on is on vectors. We'll need them to describe interesting curves and planes in our three-dimensional space. But we first want to just get acquainted with general shapes and positioning in three-dimensional space. Often, unfortunately, when we're working visually with three dimensions, we're doing math in a two-dimensional page, and it's tough. And you got to kind of use some visual creativity when you're doing this. There's a couple different ways to draw these axes, but just to show you how I do it, I draw a horizontal line for my x-axis, and then I draw the y here at about a 45-degree angle, and then my z-axis coming through. Again, when you're thinking about this, think about looking down at the x-y two-dimensional plane, and then the z-axis is coming out to give it some of that vertical depth. But importantly here, and you'll notice, it gets a little bit awkward when you're trying to sketch stuff in these three dimensions, um, but let's just look at an ordered triple real fast. So let's say three comma four comma two, by the way, we call two-dimensional two points ordered pairs. The ordered part means that we go in alphabetical order. So this is an x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and z-coordinate um, that give us a space. And when you're drawing this, this is how I would do it. So I'm going to go three on the x-axis here. So I'm just kind of making my units right here. Four on the y-axis. One, two, three, four. Um, what I will often actually do then is I will put kind of a preliminary point on the xy plane. That's the plane right here when z is zero. And so I'll go here, I gotta follow horizontally. I think that is a good spot. So I'm coming, so I'm three units here from the x-axis, four units along the y-axis. And then what I want to do is go up to, though it's kind of freaking hard to like see where I'm gonna be because of this kind of weird perspective. And so what I do is get this kind of measure and think about that going here. So this would be up one, and then up two for this spot right here, which would represent the ordered triple of three comma four comma two. And often just to help with perspective, what I'll often do are put in these dotted lines right here and then put a dotted line here to try to describe this vertical rise. Though again, whenever you're visualizing this and drawing in three dimensions, you gotta allow for a little bit of mental freedom and creativity. Couple other quick things to note about the three-dimensional space. We don't have four quadrants as we did with the XY plane. Now in this three-dimensional space, we have eight octants. Um, and also simple, really simple equations that are like variable set equal to constants. Like we have Y equal to three, which is a horizontal line that goes through the Y axis at three, or X equals two, which is a straight vertical line. So these are like the most simple of the two-dimensional e equations to graph. Um, in the three-dimensional plane, what we get are things like Z equals, let's say one, or, z or X equals three. These are actually planes. For example, if we wanted to look at z equals zero, what this is is actually what we would call the xy plane. It is the plane of all the points that have a z value of zero. So all of the points that land here on our normal two-dimensional axis, and here I'll try to sketch what this plane looks like. It's gonna be a little bit weird with all these details already in. But this whole shape right here, which just is right here on the xy axis, this whole thing we call a plane. It's like a piece of paper that lands on that. We actually would also call this the xy plane. If we have y equals zero, this would be the xz plane, which is simply just a plane of points where all the points have a y value of zero. I'm not going to try to throw that in because I think this is going to get really messy and hard to do. My drawing in three dimensions isn't great sometimes, but it would be this plane right here where all the, the y values, there'd be no um, y change at all from negative or positive. They're all zero and you're on just the, uh, we call it the x, z plane right there. And then in the same way, if we had x equals zero, we would be on the y, z plane, which is the plane of points where all the x values are equal to zero. 
and I'm inspired to at least make an attempt at showing you a non-zero plane right here. So let's say something like x equals 3. This is the plane that has all the points that have an x value of 3 right here. So let's just uh, say where 3 is right here. Uh, and I'm first going to start by just putting a uh, line that's parallel to the y-axis right there. And the plane would have a vertical side like this. Oh, this ain't going too bad. I'll throw it in there. I'm actually pretty proud of this so far, I think. Well, I'm maybe speaking too soon here. Here we go. This plane is that plane right there. Again, a perfectly flat plane. And this obviously is, is infinitely wide and infinitely long. Um, but this is the plane of all the points that have an x value of 3 for all the different y, x, or y and z coordinates. And as we know, when we're looking to find the distance between any two points in two dimensions, we can use it with this formula right here, which is simply an application of the Pythagorean theorem, right? We can create this horizontal change and the vertical change. Those squared equal the hypotenuse, which is the direct distance be in between any two points. And again, so like we're looking at a point that's right here. I'm just thinking about the xy plane right here and uh, a point up here. We're looking for that direct distance. What we do is we find the y and the x distance, create a right triangle, and we have that hypotenuse. The only difference is now if we have three dimensions, we'll have this length describes this distance, but then we're going to have this three-dimensional piece coming off. But the key is that the height of that leg, which we can now think of as a leg of a triangle, and this is a leg of a triangle, we have the hypotenuse, which is kind of coming off of the paper. It's really hard for me to draw this in a beautiful way. Trust me, I've tried. Um, but importantly, this piece becomes one of the legs, the two-dimensional distance, and then that vertical change, the, the, the change in the heights becomes another leg of a triangle, and so the distance in 3D between those points is this distance from one of the legs squared plus the vertical distance squared equals the hypotenuse squared. Or in other words, the distance between two ordered triples is almost exactly the same. All we need to add under this square root is that term for the z's. We get that the distance is x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared plus z2 minus z1 squared. And then we just apply the square root to all of that or apply a square to that distance. And last thing for our foundational concepts is the midpoint of two ordered triples. Again, I'm not going to spend the time trying to draw this. I would ask you to look at a computer-generated description of this. But if you have two points in the three-dimensional plane, it's exactly the same idea in the two dimensions, that if you're trying to find the point that's directly in the direct line between those two points, but directly in the middle, you just take the averages of all the x values, the y values, and the z values. Or in other words, the midpoint, which is a point, would be x1 plus x2 divided by 2, that's an x right there, uh, y1 plus y2 divided by 2, and then z1 plus z2 divided by 2. Again, the way to think about this is to find the midpoint, so that point directly in line with that direct line distance between those two points, is just take the x values, find the average. Take the y values, find the average, and the z values, and find the average. So far, the only equations that we've seen in the three-dimensional plane are these planes that are just like x equals 3, y equals 0. Just these flat planes with a, which are, represent all of the points that have a, a constant x value, y value, or a z value. The other ones that we can tackle at this point, and we'll do more in the near future, but at this point, we can easily talk about knowing the distance formula. We can easily describe the equation for a sphere. A sphere, as de described, is a set of points that are exactly a certain r units, r, which is we call our radius, from a certain center. So we have a center point anywhere in our, on our plane, our three-dimensional plane, and we want all of the points that are exactly r units away. Well, simply, we can use this distance formula, formula to create that. But if we define this as a center as a comma b comma c, the equation, and it, again, it shouldn't be surprising to us, is x minus a squared plus y minus b squared 
plus z minus c squared. And instead of taking the square root of that in order to create the full spherical shape, and we know this with our shapes of circles in the two-dimensional plane, we will actually square that distance or that radius. And again, this equation is exactly the same as this equation, except for instead of having this second point right here, we'll just call either the first point or the second point, we'll call this one a constant a comma b comma c, and then instead of using the square root, we're gonna keep the square over here because the square root would limit us to just a, a half hemisphere, half the sphere. This right here, just like circles in the two-dimensional plane, will give us the whole equation or the whole graphical representation of a sphere. And finally, we have a ball, which is exactly the same thing as a sphere, but a sphere is the, the shell. If we wanted to fill that in, so something that we could play baseball with or golf, I'm trying to think of balls that are actually solid and not just these round blown up things. Um, but if we want all of the points, not just on the exterior, but also the interior, our description is exactly the same. The adjustment is the distance that the the distance is less than or equal to these r units. And our equation is exactly the same, it's just these distances. The only adjustment is we're not gonna set it equal to the radius squared, we're going to be less than or equal the radius squared. And importantly to reiterate, the set of points that make up a ball contain all of the points of the sphere, but also all the points that have a distance less than the radius to the center, so it's a complete solid object. All right, so one great application to do at this point with all the recent stuff we just talked about is to write an equation for a sphere that has a diameter with endpoints of five, negative one, negative three, and negative one, negative nine, negative three. And so what is being described right here, so a sphere doesn't have just one diameter, right? If you cut through from one end through the center of the sphere to the other side, that's a diameter, and so there's an infinite number of those on any sphere. So this is just one of them. These are these points are on the outer edge of the sphere, and the dis the line that goes directly between them cuts through the middle. That's really important to understand here. But the two things that we need to find using that equation of the sphere we just had is we need to know the radius and we need to know the center. Beautifully, we can answer both of those easily right here, actually using these two equations. So the, the, the center of the sphere is actually just the midpoint of these two points. If you think about, right, since it goes through the middle, if you go halfway in between those two, you have the center. So to find the center of our sphere, all we need to do is find the midpoint. The midpoint of this is five plus negative one divided by two. Again, just the average of all of these negative one plus negative nine divided by two, and negative three plus negative three divided by two. An easy math here is four divided by two gives me two. This is negative 10 divided by two gives me a negative five. And actually, since these are both the same, the average is the same, it's, or negative six divided by two gives me negative three. So here we have our center, which is the first bit of business that we need to do. And then in order to find the radius, what I could do is take the distance between these two points in the diameter, and then take that distance and divide it by two, because I'd get the length of that diameter right, divided by two to find the radius, or since I've already find this, found the center, all I need to do is find the distance between the center and then one of these two points, uh, and I'll just compare it with this point right here. So the radius in this case, would be uh, this distance, right? The distance between these two points, which is five minus two squared plus negative one minus negative five squared and then negative three um, minus negative three squared. We need to take the square root of this and actually this term right here, negative three plus three will be zero. That doesn't offer anything. And this will be three squared, and this will be four squared. So to write that out, what I'll have here is three squared. So that would be nine. This again will be negative one plus five will be four squared, which is 16, which will be the square root of 25, giving me a radius of five. And now that I have my center and my radius, creating the equation for my sphere is pretty dang easy. It's simply x minus the x-coordinate of my center right here, squared, plus y 
minus the y coordinate, but in this case, that would be going subtract negative five or plus five squared plus z minus the z coordinate, which would end up being a plus three squared equals my radius squared of 25. So this is the equation of the sphere described above that I know now has a radius of five and a center of two comma negative five comma negative three.